Thank you very much for joining our third session of the Investor Education Conference. Many of you have actually been to the previous ones, but for those who are new, I just want to recap that the purpose of these is to educate and, and provide some guidance for investors who have traditionally not invested in the life sciences space to feel a little bit more comfortable or understand the language and the nuances of investing in life sciences. So all of the attendees, all of the audience are people who have invested, um, maybe not in life sciences opportunities. Um, and what we're trying to do is just instill a little bit of knowledge in, um, uh, that when they're having conversations with groups like you know, Thin Air Labs or Halo Health or with our UC team, they understand what the language is. Um, so uh, with that, um, if you have any questions and we encourage audience participation, please just type your question either in the general chat um, in Zoom or directly to me. I'll relay, relay those questions to uh, our moderator. And, um, and we'll try and get your questions answered. Uh, again, the purpose of this particular session is on due diligence. So if you have any due diligence related questions or any other questions, please feel free to type them up in the chat. So with that, um, I will introduce our moderator, Crystal, Crystal Phillips. So she leads the health sector at Thin Air Labs, uh, which is a founder focused innovation and investment firm. In 2010, Crystal co-founded the Branch Out Neurological Foundation, which continues to accelerate new technologies and approaches to neurological disorders in universities across Canada. She is a former national level speed skater and a dedicated patient advocate. So when she's not moving mountains, uh, when she's not moving mountains in health, she's climbing them in the Canadian Rockies with her dog named Bear. So Crystal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nima, and hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning. I'm excited to be here, and, and I have to say, if there's any silver lining to COVID, um, I would say that it's put a spotlight on the healthcare system. It's put a spotlight on life sciences as a sector, and it's definitely poured a lot of innovation here. Now, as we know, with as investors, when there's lots of innovation, lots of resources, um, we have more funding and we have increased R&D. And now it's up to us as leaders in health to be able to turn that R&D into amazing companies that provide not only returns on our, our investments, but also uh, what I call IOI, which is impact on our investments. So this can be our new calculation is ROI plus IOI. Um, so to help us get both of those, um, we have two incredible speakers today to talk about the additional layer um, that is needed to put into your due diligence process. And that has a lot to do with the scientific validation and addressing the other nuances in the life sciences sector. So um, first off, I'm going to introduce Luke Sheen. Um, Luke and I have been meeting for over a year and Although his bio, I actually think is quite modest. Um, he is an innovator himself and he is truly, um, he thinks big about not only um, the organization of Halo Health, but he thinks big about the healthcare sector and has a good eye for finding those gaps and thinking creatively about how to fill them. So Luke is the executive director of Halo Health and in his previous career, he was part of a startup team that exited in 2016 and was a senior consultant at a global strategy management consulting firm with client coverage in various industry verticals. To give back to community, Luke served as a mentor for a not-for-profit organization, Business in the Streets. It helped young individuals from underserved communities establish their own businesses. Currently, Luke handles the strategic planning and day-to-day -day activities of Halo Health full-time and is an advisor to a BIPOC venture fund, um, capital fund, Bay Mills Investment Group. Now, Halo Health is an incredible organization. It's um, new as of, I think, a year and a half, and they've got over 250 to 300 um, physician angel investors. And so without um, spoiling any of the great um, details of Halo Health, um, I'll let Luke take it from there. Um, I'll also like to introduce our, our other panelist, Peter Santosha. Um, Peter started his career in technology commercialization at University Technologies International, 
where he and a small team made foundational investments in local companies like Circle Cardiovascular, Parvis Therapeutics, and Zephyr Sleep Technologies. In 2010, Peter left UTI to pursue an entrepreneurial journey that has taken him into leadership roles in industries that include medical devices, enhanced oil and gas recovery, software as a service, and direction drilling. Recently, Peter has returned to his roots in technology commercialization, joining Innovate Calgary as the executive director of seed funds to launch and manage USEED, the University of Calgary's group of pre-seed slash seed investment funds. This is an amazing opportunity to again, turn the incredible R&D that's happening across our country and especially at UC um, and, and building companies out of them and moving them closer from that ideation stage all the way to making impact. So without further ado, Pete, the floor is yours. Thanks, Crystal. So I'll just uh, share my screen quickly here. Uh, it's always a journey to figure out exactly which one to share. <clears throat> so hopefully everyone can see my screen okay. Uh, yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, so I think that um, the first thing uh, I want to get across here is that the um, it's important, I think, to understand what you're trying to achieve with your due diligence. And so I think in terms of framing um, UCED, I think it's important to understand what we are and why we do what we do, okay? So the first thing is UCED is a venture philanthropy, philanthropy fund, meaning that we're taking uh, donor dollars that are provided to the university and deploying them in a very specific way. That specific way is to support the mandate of the university, which is to advance research, uh, provide world-class educational opportunities, and integrate that research, research and education within the community, okay? So what that means is that for us, our due diligence process, while robust, is, is considering other factors, not just return. We have, a, we have an evergreen mandate, which means we are looking for return. We're trying to make the best decisions possible to bring money back into the fund, which then gets reinvested. Uh, in that fund with the idea of ideally creating something that can go on in perpetuity. But, you know, we're not always trying to hit the, 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 the you know, 10 times return, the VC returns, like, you know, singles and doubles, as they say, are as good as home runs for us in some cases. So I think it's important to consider that in our process. Our process is designed to identify the, the biggest opportunities, but I think it's also important to understand that side of things. Um, why do we exist? I think it's also really important to understand what we call the capital gap. And the capital gap is something that is common. It's pretty well understood out there. And that is that if, if you look at uh, funding for research and funding for innovation in the university environments, um, where, where it ends is kind of right at proof of concept. And the problem becomes is that from proof of concept to like proof of value, which is this gap between an, uh, uh, an uh, an idea or a spark of an opportunity to engagement by venture capital or the angel, there's this big kind of gap in capital. And where we fit is in this red space and we fit in an area and I'm gonna introduce a concept called technology readiness level, um, which is going from one to very, very early basic research on the left, all the way out to sort of commercial product on the right, which would be a 10. Um, and that's the, the graph at the bottom. And where we sit is in the red area. Uh, tier level two through seven. It's not a perfect system for medical devices. It's something that was developed for, the, um, for engineering and things of like that, but it's, it's just helpful to understand when I talk about technologies where they sit. So I've introduced that. But we sit in this gap, and this is exactly where what our, our how we're deploying capital is to trying to move these very early stage technologies who are in the gap from the left to the right. Okay, and so that's what our due diligence process is designed to understand, and then ultimately how it informs our decision making. I won't say too much other than um, we have $13 million under management. Um, the key funds we're talking about today are, are two child, our child health fund, which is a $5 million fund and a general health fund. And the due diligence process I'm describing here is specific to these funds. We have two other funds that have their own due diligence processes. And again, they have slightly different mandates, slightly different focus. And so their due diligence process and the things they consider will be a little bit different. But today we're talking about health. And so what I want to do is first give you a quick overview of what that looks like. Again, back to this point of where do we invest? The, the, the circle on the left, this is a bit of a busy slide, but it's a, it's a much more robust outline that TRL level one through seven that's specific for medical devices. 
And what I just want to point out is that sort of red triangle that's there is where we focus our investment. So proof of concept through to proof of value again, right? Which is this kind of early stage of investment. But I think it's important to note that you have to consider sort of a number of different areas in that space. And, and what this graphic shows is, you know, we're looking at product market fit, business readiness, regulatory compliance, and product development. But that is the triangle we're focused on. If your due diligence process was focused farther, you know, at a different part of the of this circle, then you would design it slightly different. The other thing that's important to understand is that we're not specific to a certain vertical. Um, so for example, we're not specifically focused on therapeutics or diagnostics. We cover the whole gamut, okay? And what that means is that um, we have to like have <laughs> almost a, a mile wide and an inch deep in a lot of areas, right? But that, that is kind of early stage investing. Um, so what you see here is our first year of intake and the breakdown by intake of how, how the different technologies break down. And so we've invested or we've seen a lot of diagnostic software and medical devices, but we've invested across the whole spectrum. So we've made investments in just about every one of these verticals. And what I want to share with you now is some of the things that we kind of consider and how these inner things, how the things that we're evaluating, how they interplay with each other just at a very high level. And then I'm happy to come back and, and we can dig deeper in certain areas. So this is our investment process. And the first thing I want to do is I don't want to scare off investors from investing in this space. We have what I would consider a very robust investment process for the stage of investing that we are doing. And I'm happy to like step back at the end of this and just talk about things that like are kind of must versus nice to haves. But we, we take a pretty robust process and I, there's for some very specific reasons, which I can go into later, but we have what we call a five gate process. And to me, uh, any due diligence, due diligence process has to have a couple features. It has to have a screening feature or a scoring feature. How do you take a large number of potential opportunities and reduce that down? We use the scorecard approach. Uh, we have a number of people to score those cards and that we take it down to sort of, in this case, in, over the last nine months, we take it from 150 down to 25. So that was, that's our gate one. Gate two is, this is where we really start to get into more heavier due diligence. Um, and so in our case, we use a number of variables and we try to use independent third parties as much as possible. We do our own due diligence and research. We evaluate the team, et cetera, et cetera. But we do try and get expert reviews. We, we like to do an IP review. We think it's a fundamental piece of early stage companies. Um, we do uh, clinical advisory. So what we're trying to do is get a clinical perspective. And I'm not going to get too deep into that because I think Luke's got a really interesting model there for, for trying to get clinical validation or independent validation that an idea makes sense at an early stage. Um, and then we, we do you know, a bunch of digging in that space. And from that, our next we, we narrow it down again. So if we're not satisfied with what we see or if what we saw in the original application or review, tells us that this isn't something's not adding up, then we'll narrow it down from there. But that is the gate. Gate two for us is kind of like the, this business is interesting. We'd like to move forward with an investment. From there, we kind of switch to an advocate type of thing. And because, and this is again, our process, we have a approval process where we then take these companies to an investment advisory group. And this is made of, uh, of uh, high net worth individuals, people who invest in the space, who've been there, done that. I see actually a couple of them on the screen today. Hi, Jahangir. And, uh, and they, they then uh, provide us with their feedback and opinion. We don't always get approval. So as you can see from the numbers at the top, um, we've taken 20 through uh, in the first nine months, we got approved for 15. The last step for us is once we get the approval is then we move into corporate due diligence. Now corporate due diligence, just for clarification is like, is the intellectual property property properly licensed into the company? Is there unanimous shareholders in place? Is employment agreements in place? So this is corporate due diligence. That's just something that you might choose to do earlier in the process. We choose to do it later, partly because we engage like uh, the, the law school here to help do some of the stuff and we need a little bit extra time to do it. So again, our due diligence process, you have to keep in mind is it's pretty robust, but we're also building in other things into our process, educational opportunities for students and things of that nature. So that's partly why it's, it's so robust and so broad. Um, so that's our overall process, and I think that's important. And now I'm just going to talk about three key areas that we look at that we feel are very important and how we kind of at a high level look at these things. So the first thing is, and this is, I think you'll find this quite common, like generally people look at companies in a few different ways. They look at for sure the team. So people is a very important piece. 
technology, technology development, like where are they in phase of development? What is the market? What is the market size? How unique is the solution? And we have a section we call intangible. And on the right here is our rubric. This is kind of how we score on a one to five basis because we have multiple people that kind of review these applications. So we need a standardized rubric. You personally might have your own kind of rubric as to how you do it. And our rubric evolves over time based on what we see. And, and I think in the first year, we've, we've done a couple turns of this. Um, what, based on that scoring, what you see on the left is a couple different examples of how companies at different stage of TRL, TR, TRL technology readiness level, have, have played out. These are all companies that we've invested in. And the one thing I guess to take away from this is there's no perfect structure. And that's Im important to point out because if you're investing across all different um, sectors like software as a service versus therapeutics, you're gonna see very different like visual structures if you do a spider chart or a scoring system. Um, obviously software, it's actually really important that we be farther along in technology development, especially on a software as a service model versus a therapy, like you're just not gonna be very far along on technology development, but we'd like to see strong intellectual property. So things move around. Uh, the one thing that I think is consistent that we see is the overall impression that we have, or the, there's an intangible factor that as it all comes together, we generally see the intangible factor being strong, regardless of the investment we do. So how these things come together generally gives us an overall impression and that overall impression tends to be reflected in the intangible section. And that is the one thing I can say that is consistent regardless of TR level or or, um, or phase of development and whatnot. So that's the first thing. And this is, this, is, this is a summary of quite a bit of work that goes into things, but this is a high level piece that, that most people look at. The other thing we look at, I'm just gonna do a time check here. For a second. Uh, the other thing we look at is phase of technology development. Um, so what we're trying to do is again, this, in order for us to properly understand like how to move companies forward, we need to understand where they actually are. And so what we do is in, in addition to sort of evaluating the business, we're trying to understand, okay, where are they? Are they early in proof of concept? Are they got proof of concept and they're in moving through proof of feasibility to what we call proof of value? And again, we have a rubric, which is again, something that helps guide our visualization of this. And so what you have here again is three companies that we've visualized at different TRL levels. And in some cases like the bottom one, which is a, a, training, a training system, we've sort of blacked out the um, regulatory path, because there is no regulatory path in that situation. But it, it helps us kind of visualize, okay, where are they? And then it then helps us figure out what are the key things that this company needs to do next to get through that, that valley of death, that gap. So this is, this is the method we use to quantify that. The last thing that we think is very important is understanding milestones. So once you understand where the company sits in terms of its phase of development and roughly what it needs to do to get that next phase, the question becomes like, how much money will it take to get to that next phase? How long will it take? And then how realistic is the, is the goal or objective? Um, are, they, are they taking too big a bite out of what they're trying to get done? Can it be broken down into smaller pieces? When, when is the significant milestone that we think would be that value inflection point or uh, inflection point in general that's gonna grab the attention of folks? And so from our perspective, this is a table that we ask all our companies to put together, which is basically them telling us what their journey is. And it consists of three key things. Where do they think their funding is gonna come from in the next couple of years? How are they gonna use that capital? And what are, the, what are the key technical or business milestones that they're going to actually achieve in that time frame? And that allows us to kind of understand like how they're thinking about the business and then sort of position that relative to where we think investors will, will want them to go. And in a lot of cases, we'll have a dialogue with them and say, listen, we don't think that milestone makes sense. Have you considered the following, right? Um, and, and again, for us, this is, this is a pretty robust uh, activity for, for early stage companies. And we get this feedback. And I think there might even be a few folks who have been through this process who would say, wow, this is like a really, for an early stage company, you're asking us to do a lot. But that's partly because we're we're a we're not like a VC fund. It's not about whether or not we want like we want to invest. The question is, so we don't generally say no to companies. We say no, not yet. And so what this whole process is about for us is going back to them and saying, listen, we need you to do the following things before we can get our minds around these things. And so we have that feedback loop right from the get go. So on scoring, we come back to them and tell them, 
on our first gate, like, hey, this is why we couldn't, we couldn't move you forward. These are the things we need to improve. They don't go through the second gate. This is, we come back and say, this is why you didn't get through the, the next gate. So for us, we've actually done, you know, we're actually looking at how many companies we've said no to in the past that we've actually been able to invest going forward. And, and part of this whole process is helping them with that. So again, this is some of our design that comes with what we're trying to do with the program. Um, and it's not necessarily what you would all do with, with your system, but I do think that your overall assessment of the company, you know, the people, the market opportunity is important, where the company is in terms of stage of development, like trying to understand exactly where they fit. And lastly, like what is the plan to go from where they are today to the next phase or the three kind of key things that you're trying to understand. Um, all of this comes together into an investment memo. I'm happy to go through what our investment memo looks like. Again, we have an investment advisory group. You, you may not have that, so there may be no requirement for us. For us, we have to summarize all this information into a format that our investment advisory groups can digest. One valuable piece that this has uh, generated is we're, we're finding a lot of the companies we invest in like to have this document, and they're using it with other investors because it helps other investors wrap their head around like exactly all these three things. And then the last thing we do, and I won't spend a lot of time on this because I'm out of time and I'm happy to come back to this, is part of what we're doing with our due diligence process is to help us get to a point where we can understand if we're going to go forward, like how should we structure this investment? Um, if, we're, if we're part of an existing investment round, obviously the decision is just do we invest in the round or not? But in a lot of cases, because we're so early, we're leading an investment. And so we use a couple different systems and structures, but the due diligence ultimately helps us decide, like, what's the quantum of risk we want to take on this particular investment? Should we tranche or not tranche? And if we are going to tranche, what is the technical milestone? What is the key milestone that will allow us to make a, you know, defer a, a maybe another investment to make sure that it's headed the right direction? So all this information kind of feeds into some of these, these uh, final decisions at the same time. So I think I'm uh, I want to make sure there's lots of time for discussion here, so I'll shut it down there, but that should hopefully give you a, an overview, the high points of the waves, as it were, of our process. And again, I don't want to overwhelm everyone. I think your process is your process and you invest, but, you know, those three kind of areas that I talked about, you know, in our opinion, are the things that you really want to wrap your mind around. Back to you, Crystal. Thank you, Pete. That was great. Um, I'm going to save the questions for after, after Luke. Um, but please, if you do have any questions, as Nima mentioned on the chat, you can message him directly or um, to everyone in, in the chat and we'll address the questions after. So next up is Luke Sheen. Great. Thank you, Crystal. And thank you, uh, Peter. Wonderful talk. I, I surely learned a lot. I just want to verify that everyone can see my screen. Good to me. Great. Yep. All right. Thank you. Uh, so a little bit of background about our organizations before uh, diving into the good parts. Um, Halo Health, uh, in short, is uh, Canada's first not-for-profit physician angel group. But uh, the thesis uh, came from much more than that. And, and it really, it, what it boils down to is that a uh, bunch of entrepreneurial-minded physicians, uh, some of whom we have on the call today, and it's also nice to see familiar faces, uh, they thought that there must be a better way in which a physician can become stakeholders and also help healthcare startups. So we decided to become a place where healthcare uh, physicians and, and healthcare startups can come and meet to help each other out. Uh, for the physicians, we're trying to position ourselves to become a physician enablement capacity building platform, i.e. there's 90,000 physicians in Canada. So we're trying to recruit, educate, and activate them to become Halo Health physicians and thereby becoming an effective investor advisors. And then by channeling their efforts, uh, we provide uh, specialty matched advisory connections into the healthcare space and direct investment. Uh, in short, uh, we are uh, very market niche driven in healthcare and uh, trying to be uh, more focused in providing smart capital. Uh, we are not a pre committed capital fund but rather we are a physician exclusive angel group. And because of that reason, the startups that we are looking for are those that are solving real world clinical problems. Um, like uh, the area that Pete focuses in, uh, we are uh, looking for startups right at the pre-seed seed stage. Uh, we are very impact driven. So we're trying to see 
where our physician investor advisors can add the most amount of impact as angels. Uh, some KPIs and quick facts about us. So we launched in January of 2020, so we are quite early. However, we went from seven physician angel investor advisors to over 260 in that time. And collectively as a group, have invested a little over $2.5 million into 22 ventures. And uh, we're humbled and proud to report that out of those, uh, we've already had uh, three exits. Uh, so kudos to those startup founders who work so hard to uh, make an awesome product that's really changing everyone's life on a day-to-day -day basis. So I wanted to dive uh, a bit more into uh, the profiles of our angel investors and why uh, our group uh, is doing what we're doing and why they're different than your everyday physician. It's because of the fact that uh, they are not only excellent physicians, but they have the interest and the energy uh, and the focus uh, to be uh, folks that are venture founders or chief medical officers or are advisors to create a disruption lab and thereby have the expertise to truly be an advisor and be effective at it. Also, there's power in numbers that over 260 physicians represent 40 different subspecialties. So chances are, uh, whichever startups that come in through our door, uh, we are able to ask and recruit physicians that represent all the different specialties listed here to get an in-depth look, uh, a first-hand look from a specialist uh, that knows the space better than anyone. Uh, here are our board of directors, and I wanted to point this out because although we started Ontario, there are pockets of physicians that are like-minded coming forward who are willing to interact, build a community, and help the startups. And I'm proud to say that uh, we have Dr. Mike Kalisiak and Dr. Catherine Dundas, who are board directors, but also on the ground in Calgary, uh, helping local startups and also being a representative of Halo Health. And that's why I'm so excited to be here today, because there's a lot of interesting things and smart startups and awesome people uh, on the ground in Calgary as well. Also, you know, uh, we're all about people here at Halo Health. And one thing that we are is that we are inclusive. And Although these fellows are earlier in their training because they're residents or postdocs or MBA students, uh, we believe in gathering intelligence through our people. And because they are so specialized in their training and they're on the ground and learning the next cutting edge technologies, uh, believe it a lot, not only are our physicians add uh, value in terms of subject matter expertise, but they also bring uh, a lot of new things that um, some of the or senior physicians might have not been trained on. And also, I think it's an uh, important extra variable that we add in our due diligence because these folks are going to be the future leaders of tomorrow and understand the needs of the changing landscape of healthcare delivery. So we try to include everyone during our due diligence process and escalate uh, human capital involvement at each stage. Uh, just to give, show you guys a range of our organization, uh, you know, we wouldn't be here and we'll be able to do what we do without our friends and partners um, across the nation. And uh, again, we are looking forward to getting to know everyone better in Calgary and work with everyone. But because of these great ecosystem partners, uh, we're able to interact with them during the due diligence process. And rather than working in a combative way, work in a collaborative way to augment each other's gaps and knowledge. What we're good at because of our position is medical specialist uh, knowledge and fact checking but not all of our folks are trained in business operations or computer software engineering. And that's why we're so glad to have uh, prolific people across the nation who are willing to work with us and share the due diligence process to holistically help the startup and co-invest together. So now we have the background out of the way, uh, let's jump into the due diligence aspect of things. Uh, I just wanted to outline some themes that will be repeated throughout the rest of the presentation uh, in, in bullet points. And, First point is that, uh, you know, as many of you may know, healthcare startups, uh, they're not the same. And each one is very different. So therefore, we believe that each vertical has to have a different due diligence approach. Also, uh, we're not a pre-committed capital fund. Uh, we're an angel investor group. So one thing I do want to deliver and make it clear is that angel investing is not passive investing. Um, Angel investors are important and they add a lot of intangible value uh, during the due diligence process, but also post-investment. Uh, also, uh, while doing due diligence, I think as a people doing it and also speaking about it, I think it's important to internalize that 
we have to be uh, very active and having our ears to the ground and gathering competitive intelligence through every deal that we process. And by doing so, uh, this is kind of coming to shape at Halo Health because we see so many healthcare uh, startups coming to us. We're able to better understand each category vertical and have uh, comparables within our internal database to see who the leaders and the laggers are. And the final point is uh, something that I want to deliver is, again, during the due diligence and post-investment uh, process, uh, everyone can't be good at everything but they can be great at one thing. So I believe, again, collaboration is important where we share the subject matter experts and conduct due diligence together, and then thereby organically transition to investing together, and then therefore as a team, support the startup and uh, help them succeed. There is a bit of a more in-depth book at going from the outside in, in our due diligence process. And, and we see this more as a de-riskment and determination of best fit for the angels. And we escalate uh, our angel investors' involvement throughout this process. Uh, you know, this, there's a lot of aspects to a startup and I'll use one as an example, uh, digital health. Obviously, because of our evolving technology, there's a software component, there's a clinical component, and then the regulatory component. I think that's why it's important, and we did this actually, where we chunked out the supporters and, and, and the investors all communicated, whether it be institutional or angels, where what we're good at is, again, medical validation and on the ground clinical uh, integration workflow feasibility assessment. Uh, but then we had another VC who was an utmost expert at SAS B2B software vetting. So they checked all the code. And thereby, again, finding the fit determining whether or not you'll be an impactful investor and organizing a team in a more holistic way. Not only were we able to get through due diligence quicker and more effectively, but rather have those uh, individuals set ready to invest and better help de-risk the investment profile uh, post-investment. So before really getting to the nitty gritty, we can go all day and, uh, you know, Peter has an excellent version of this as well and every team has an excellent version of this. But what, what I wanted to kind of step away from is make a note that as unique as each startup is, each due diligence effort is going to be different. It, it's not going to be prescript, uh, prescriptive. So then, you know, we're looking at holistic uh, qualitative questions like, is a startup solving an important problem that actually exists? Will their product actually solve it? And what they're solving, it, 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 the method, is it, is it sound? Is it scientifically validated? So then that's when we go to the right side, the clinical aspect where we recruit our uh, army of physicians and, and our friends to get an on-ground report of these metrics, i.e. in more specific, we say, you know, does their execution make sense in a clinical setting? And if it's a woman's health startup, we will ask uh, a group of ob guys who see this every day. Uh, and we are very honest about also asking how much resistance will they have being able to deploy in the real world? Does it actually integrate with the current healthcare system? Uh, will the end users actually use it? Will, will, the, will you as doctors or nurses or any of your teammates in the healthcare field actually use this product? And who will pay for that product? That's another big thing we, we need to look for is, is, you know, there might be a market for it. It might be scientifically validated. And, you know, what they're proposing makes sense. But if, if no one's going to pay for it, then, then it's not a product. It's a great idea, but it's not feasible. And I think, you know, that's, that's what I love about this type of uh, due diligence process is because you engage all these people and get real world factual reports and scientific fact checking but also by doing it over and over again, you get a holistic idea of that space and truly understand what the startups are getting at. And again, benchmark internally, the leaders and the laggers. And here's another point I, I wanted to make, which is after the investment, that's, that's really uh, only half the puzzle, I, I believe, in due diligence. And also, you know, why are we doing the diligence? To, to try to get at higher ROI. And one thing I do want to drive home is that, you know, we can't predict the future or else everybody would be great investors. But here are some great examples how Halo Health Angels bring in tangible value to de-risk their investment profile and uh, for the co-investors and ultimately help the startup succeed. 
And it's the fact that they bring their own value add in a very specific way. So not only do we do our engage our specialists to do due diligence, but we engage them after they invest to help the startups out. So what we mean by that is have them actually make the calls to the right people to connect them, bring them into the clinical environment, help them find patients, help design clinical studies, and thereby effectively uh, changing the future and, and helping as much as they can to de-risk their investment profile and help the company succeed. And I think, again, in a collaborative environment, we all have different values to add. And by being proactive and not a passive investor as an angel, being an active investor, uh, you know, I, I think there are instances where uh, our angels have uh, definitely changed the outcome and, and uh, pathway for the startup. So, you know, all this is great, but, you know, the saying goes, the proof is in the pudding. Well, to be quite candid with you, our pudding is not quite done yet because we've only been operating for uh, about a year, year and a half at most. Um, but we are learning and we are constantly improving our process and our model. So something that I did want to leave everyone with is the numbers look great, the returns are great. But uh, what I want to truly make it clear is that the barrier to entry for healthcare technology is now lower than ever. You know, you talk to your folks three years ago and say so you can see your, you know, home doctor on your phone, they'd say, get out of here. They wouldn't be able to use it. But now it's an everyday part of deal uh, where it's telemedicine is even recognized by a lot of uh, governing bodies as a billable code. So I think that's exactly why uh, these timelines between after the outbreak of COVID and now has been uh, fueling innovation in healthcare startups to be in the front page because people are realizing that these technologies that they're helping and, and investing in could actually save people's lives. They can actually alter your loved one's lives and even yours. And I, I might be biased, but I think that's like the most interesting and most awesome way to support uh, an industry vertical that's actually making an impactful difference. And these startups that exited, you know, it's exciting to, you know, go around Toronto and see them on the billboard or see them in an asset. Like this is a very palpable, real thing and they're growing quicker faster than ever before and and the other side of that is there is growing capacity in marketplace for canadian acquisition of canadian healthcare there's a growing trend of canadian public companies acquiring small healthcare startups so there is a marketplace for it also the healthcare startups because of that uh variables i mentioned before they're going public faster than ever before so the the hold of, of the investment cycle is becoming shorter and companies growing uh, IPO faster and being acquired faster than ever before. So in short, uh, you know, that indicates that there is increasing market demand for healthcare startups and this is the best time to invest in them. And you, each and each, uh, individual that's dialed then can help a startup and have their own expertise. So, you know, in a closing note, I, I wanna leave with that sentiment that uh, you know, I hope everyone gets excited about the space, uh, wants to get involved in the due diligence, collaborate and work together and truly support these startups and uh, have some good ROI too. Um, so thank you again, uh, Yusin, uh, Nima, Crystal, uh, and wonderful talk by Pete for inviting us uh, to be able to speak with you. Uh, I'm looking forward to connecting with each and one of you if you have any questions. Uh, we're always looking out for uh, passionate physicians in your uh, community who might want to get involved. Uh, so here's my email. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions, comments, concerns. Uh, I have an open door policy. So thank you. Uh, Crystal, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks so much, Luke. And, and feel free to add your, your email into the chat as well. Um, as mentioned, if you have any questions, we are now moving into the Q&A section. Um, so if you have questions for Luke or Pete or anyone on the um, committee for this event, um, we're, all, we're all here and happy to answer the questions. Um, I have to say it's really nice to see um, a couple of major themes coming out of both of your talks. One is around, you know, the high potential for ROI, um, both that and the impact that you're, you're pursuing and, and how impact driven you are. The other thing that I like is um, it seems like there's this uh, theme around due diligence and, and creating a founder friendly version. Pete, you mentioned um, 
saying no, not yet, and um, having more of that long-term vision of building the ecosystem and knowing that um, if, it's, if it's not yet, there, there may be some advice or new connections that can help move that health company forward. So it's really great to see. I feel like we're all in really good company and I'm starting to see that theme, not only in both of your talks, but in with many conversations um, with, with others who are on this call today. Um, now, I want to dive into one specific question that I think, um, Luke, you did a great job of covering, and Pete, I would like to know your um, opinion on this as well. Um, now, me as a non-medical um, um, physician or scientist, when I hear doctor or when I hear scientist, I just think, okay, they're the expert in everything health. So there's one thing to have the third party uh, look um, to help you with your due diligence, but how do you vet the third party? And how do you know that you know, if you have a med tech company that you would like vetting, um, how do you know that your third party resource is the appropriate one for that? Um, for that question. So um, Pete, maybe we'll start with you and then Luke, I'd love to hear your answer as well. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, we're fortunate enough through um, the Life Science Innovation Hub that we have like a quite a large group of expert advisors that we maintain as sort of mentors for companies uh, that the Life Science Hub works with. So the way we kind of look at it is we look at the, the, the fit, like what is the technology we're looking at? And so we, as much as possible, try to to, to match like reviewers, specifically expert reviewers uh, with the actual technology type. So therapy with therapy, diagnostic, diagnostic. That's point one. But, but I, I don't think um, the one area that I think we're actually building our program around right now, we're just building what we're calling a clinical advisory group, which is very much in support of what Luke is bringing forward, which is this, this frontline perspective, right? Like what is the physician view? Um, and, and building that in. And so that's something that we're building into our process. Again, for, for us, sometimes like we're so early on some of the stuff that it's, it's an idea, right? But I will tell you definitively, like one of the de-risking factors for us is when we have a company that is being led by physicians uh, in the space, right? So you've already got stuff built into it. And so we see that a fair bit, but I, to answer your question, like it's not an easy thing. We have some fortunate pieces that we have that we can kind of match people together, but we absolutely do exactly what Luke is doing with his models. We look for clinical validation upfront to say that, yes, this is a real problem. And yes, there's, there's a potential demand in the future. Go ahead, Luke. Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, Gee, thanks. Uh, really well put. Uh, agreed on all fronts. Um, you know, one thing that I think our group tries to do to address that is uh, we're very honest about what we're good at and what we're not good at. And, and going back to that example, uh, our folks are physicians. But then, you know, there's other aspects that we need to look for in terms of due diligence. So then we would look at the deal and we would look at our people and then identify where the gaps are. One example that comes to mind is regulatory. Um, Regulatory and approval and, and, and navigating that industry is a whole nother subject on its own. So drawing back to due diligence process not being prescriptive, uh, we identify those gaps and then we leverage on our network to find those experts who may be outside of our network. And also by working with other buy side groups, investor groups and investor organizations, they bring that expert in. So then it's like putting together a puzzle. They obviously uh, are, are at the table because they're credible. And they also are made up of amazing people. And they did their own due diligence for those aspects because they are actively interested in being serious about the investment. So with that kind of collaboration and trust, we complete the picture. So we'll bring the medical validation portion. A group might bring the software CS validation. Another might bring regulatory. And the other might bring the financial and operational management due diligence portion. And then by putting it together, uh, we're able to complete the credible due diligence process with the credible people. Usually, how we uh, operate. Thank you both, Luke and Pete. Um, to, to recap, I mean, it's it's all about the people, and it's not like when you're building that due diligence and looking for third party validation. It's not like you can build a perfect team of four or five experts that are diverse. Um, it's that that team actually is more of a network um, and it changes um, depending on the deal, especially in health. And especially if you're not focused in one uh, very specific subsector within health. 
Um, I've got another question. This one's for, for you, Luke, um, from Sarah, um, asking, can you talk about any failure that, that you might, um, that, sorry, any failure that you might have had and what had been missed and any lessons learned from that? Sure. So because our organization hasn't been long around, uh, it hasn't been around long enough, we haven't had any invested companies go to zero yet. Um, and we hope they don't. Uh, but I think internally from a due diligence perspective and our uh, learning process and how we vet the startups uh, in our formative years, I think, uh, you know, what we missed was uh, having those people that we talked about, chunking out the different expertise, having access to those people because some of our healthcare ecosystem support network is quite siloed. So I, I, if we're being honest and we were growing and uh, learning how to do this better, some of the earlier deals we vetted, uh, if we had the access to all our friends and partners that we have, we could have probably done a better job and a more thorough job. But at the time, we just didn't have that uh, connect and nor were we that cognizant that that's what's really required to do it in a better capacity. So that's one. And number two, uh, our folks are very scientific uh, per their medical training and our team is as well. But then what we're learning and improving is that by having those quantitative uh, scoring sheets that we mentioned, we're essentially building an internal library so that we have a benchmark. It's kind of like your own competitive intelligence rule book, so to speak. Uh, and as that builds, you know, hopefully we're avoiding earlier mistakes by having the NOAA and the data and the uh, know-how and the data points uh, to avoid uh, the shortfalls of uh, missing out on being able to check something out to the fullest extent or not knowing that well enough uh, to uh, create a, a true validation due diligence report. So it's a learning process. And I would say those are two major things um, in, in terms of us missing out on our early days, uh, but uh, getting better at it as we grow. Thanks, Luke. Um, Pete, I, I have a question for you, but I'd also love to hear if you have any, you know, failures that you've learned from or wanted to to um, discuss with the group today. Um, and then I have another question for for both of you. I'd like to say there's no failures, but that, that's not the case. I think in my early career, we, we kind of had the proof of we did the proof of principle for what you see has kind of been modeled after, which is we you know, and so just, just to put it in perspective, we invested, I think, 15 years ago, we invested in about 12 or 13 early stage companies, um, relatively small amounts. I think it was about $1.2, $1.3 million. And so out of that, um, there are three companies that are going concerns today uh, that are doing quite well. And it was a, quite a successful program. But given how early, and so, so I guess the bottom line is, like, I, I expect in pre-seed investment, a little less so in seed. But in pre-seed investments, you're going to have companies fail. Like that's just the reality of it, right? And so that factors into your strategy, your investment strategy, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, what we typically see failures in pre-seed is just like technology failure. Like we just, like technology doesn't deliver on what it's ultimately meant to do. We've made incorrect assumptions on, um, you know, what phase they're at. Regulatory is a very big deal. Regulatory and reimbursement can be a big issue. Like companies just don't get past or don't consider early enough those considerations. So I can't pick up one specific one, but I, but I will say that there's at least two or three that I can think of that we invested 15 years ago where, you know, we were investing in a technology milestone. The, like we, we had proof of concept, but we needed to demonstrate that it was actually feasible and just did not cross that milestone. And, um, and so those, those are some ones that we saw. We saw that in an in a, um, acoustic telemetry type of uh, product. So, uh, uh, sorry, the name's escaping me, but a, a medical device in that space and a couple other ones. Uh, sorry, what was the second part of your question? Yeah, so the other, thank you, Pete. The, the, the other two question is for both you and Luke. Um, is there any subsector that investors should avoid and vice versa, any hot, um, hot trending field? You want to go first, Luke? Well, I certainly don't want to blackball and uh, give a negative sentiment to a whole market protocol. I don't think I'm qualified enough to uh, give that perspective. But um, you know, one thing that I will use as an example of, which is true and it's studied in a lot of case studies, is um, uh, because of the market hype, 
small companies scratch building and trying to strategically and uh, you know almost aggressively force build a company for sake of raising money. Um, cannabis is an example. If, if you look at how that turned out, there's a bunch of small cap companies that didn't really have true uh, experienced leaders, but rather being um, uh, uh, parasitic almost and try to just make a quick buck and, and, and just raise money and go IPO without having the product or the good intention or the true problem solving rationale for building that company. Uh, you know, those are some of the things that actually come out when you're doing due diligence, when you engage with the founders, because, you know, real estate, it's, it's, it's uh, location, location, location. You know, we say in early stage startups, people, 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 you're betting on those founders to execute their vision and what they're uh, promising. So I would say, yeah, just um, don't read too much into the hype and, and, and the people just going again, going um, towards that. You know, one thing is startups that are just COVID-19 related. Yes, we need to solve those problems. Very true. But if you're just almost taking advantage of our pandemic and building a company around it, what are you going to do after COVID-19 is resolved? Um, it's not long-term thinking. It's more being uh, strategic to make a quick buck. So I would say avoid those kind of trendy, you know, quick formation, up and down kind of uh, startups that are trying to get to the root cause and have a passion to solve a real world persistent problem. I think that's the best way I can address that question. Um, thank you, Luke. Um, Pete, before you answer this, just to, to um, carry on with your ideas around the cannabis industry, do you see anything trending or similar in the psychedelic industry as it rises um, and, and becomes a, a bigger investment opportunity and, and becomes legalized? Um, do you think there are some, some warning flags or some opportunities that investors should be paying attention to? Yeah, there's both in my both in my opinion wearing flags and but i mean look i, I think that um you can't ignore the value creation within the cannabis market so it's i mean psychedelics you you'd be hard pressed to argue that there, there's not an opportunity there but i would also suggest that like when you're looking at psychedelics especially from a a, a therapy perspective right the question becomes i think like what is the intrinsic value of psychedelics from a therapy perspective so if i ignore like you know, what, are, you know, however, let's say common usage of psychedelics, and we, we focus on like therapeutic use of psychedelics, what are, what's the clinical perspective? Like, do physicians believe they're valuable? Like, what's the data, right? So um, we spent a lot of time on trying to validate science early on by looking at like publications, right? Like, what's the strength of the research? What's the research saying? Because Ultimately, the papers that come out in a certain space is essentially the marketing materials for the medical personnel that are going to ultimately adopt. So if there's not strong evidence, if there's not peer-reviewed journals to support the idea of the use of psychedelics within the medical community, then it's hard for me to wrap my brain around whether or not a psychedelic is a good investment, right? So we look at, at that data very early on, like, is there good evidence to support this? Are we seeing, like, on a, let's take a psychedelic company that you might want to look at investing in. What does the clinical advisory look like? Is it made up of like respected professionals within the field who might be adopters of the technology? Like I, we, we, put a, we put a lot of emphasis on encouraging early stage companies that are in a space to build a clinical advisory group of thought leaders in their space um, who can advise them on like, you know, what does the research need to look like? You know, what do they need to say, see in order to get comfortable with prescribing a therapy and things like that. So, so I think there's both, there's both opportunity and risk in that space. And again, I think to me, it comes back to some of these things that you look at to try and um, achieve independent third-party validation for an idea. Is that, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and we actually, um, your, all of your answers have ignited some, some new interesting questions amongst the crowd. Unfortunately, we're running out of time today, um, but this is great for the committee. And Nima will talk about the, the future of the, these webinar series and a, and a potential live event coming up soon. Um, we'll take all of these questions into consideration. We'll answer them as we can um, along the way, but then it'll help us create um, 
new webinars and new sessions for the live event so that we're addressing and talking about the topics that are top of mind for investors in this this area so thank you everyone for again for your your attention and time this morning and i'm going to pass it on to nima yeah, I hope everyone found today's session useful. Um, there's a lot in there. Obviously, the due diligence process is complicated and can't really be covered in, in an hour. Um, this is hopefully, uh, what we're hoping, uh, is the last webinar version of this series. Um, the next one we actually have hope to have in person. Uh, so thinking maybe late fall, um, either in late fall or um, after that one, what we do want to do is have a pitch day where we have vetted companies come in front of this group and other investors that might be interested in investing. Um, so before everyone signs off, I want to say that we'll follow up with a survey via email. Um, and what we want to do is, one, if you're interested in, in seeing some of the companies that are in Calgary, in Alberta, uh, that have kind of gone through the process, either with UCEED, Halo Health, uh, Thin Air Labs, um, and you're looking at opportunities to invest. These are companies that have already been vetted to a certain extent uh, and may be doing the next raise. So if you're interested in participating in that event, please reply. Um, sorry about that. Uh, please reply um, uh, to that email with any comments and suggestions you have. Um, but if, before everyone signs off, um, I wanted to thank the panel. Um, so Luke Sheen, Pete Santacham, uh, I'd like to thank Crystal for moderating it. Um, but I'd also very much like to thank the committee that helps put together these uh, webinars. Uh, without them, none of this would be possible. So we have Kevin Franco from uh, Platform Calgary, uh, Jasper Graywall from Venn Consulting. Uh, Crystal herself is also a part of the planning committee. Uh, Chantal Patrice from Innovate Calgary uh, and Raheem Nathu from uh, Fluid Biotech. So big thanks to all of those people. Um, We'll follow up with an email. Also, there'll be recordings to all the previous sessions as well in that email in case you miss one of the earlier ones, um, including this one. So with that, thanks everyone for attending and we'll hopefully see you in person sometime very soon. Bye everyone. Bye.